Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Matt Berkey. I'm from Think Aloud. Uh, as mentioned, we're an independent uh, 3D animation, visual effects, and uh, video production studio based in the East Midlands, uh, predominantly in Nottingham. I'm just going to run our showreel in the background uh, whilst I talk. Um, as, as mentioned, we work a lot with um, industries, man uh, manufacturers, things like that. Um, in many cases, um, a manufacturer will have a, pro a prototype of a product and they want to get it in front of people and show people how it's going to work and things like that before it's actually um, you know, been manufactured. So we get CAD models sent over to us and things like that. We'll convert that into something we can animate and then we'll produce sort of uh, videos to, to demonstrate how, pro uh, how products are going to work. Um, also, like this is an exploded uh, machine. It's uh, a metal press. Um, things like that. Um, so we, we can show things that you can't necessarily show people, you can't necessarily always give everybody a factory tour and things like that and show how their machines work, but through a video we're able to, to show them. So uh, we've worked on a wide range of things. Uh, some of these clips are a little bit older now and that. Um, this we were messing around with some motion capture to get um, the, the movement to the people and that. Uh, it's glitching a bit there. Um, there's a wide range of different software we've used over the years, uh, including um, True Space, Electric Image, um, 3ds Max, and uh, uh, Maya. Uh, but predominantly, we use uh, Blender these days, uh, and I'll get to the reasons why in a short while. So, uh, as you can see, we've done a, a wide range of things for different Kickstarter things and uh, different manufacturers. Um, it's just finding engaging ways to tell people's stories uh, through. Uh, through video, and that. Uh, this is a test we were doing with facial motion capture. Uh, so that's my colleague Nick just uh, pulling faces, and I can't remember what he's actually talking about on that because we don't have any sound. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's interesting looking back at things as well because when we're working on these projects, sometimes you, you're working on a project for a, for a good couple of months, and you, you're sick of it by the end of it because you know you're just tweaking things, tweaking things, tweaking things. Uh, and it's only when you look at, back at things later on and you can't see all the problems and the mistakes and things along the way anymore, and you, you can actually see what it is you've created. And that. so, uh, uh, as I say, there's, there's a wide range of things we've done there. So this, all, all this content is the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm doing now. Um, and just to tell you um, a little bit about, uh, more about me, um, what I enjoy most about my job is the variety of it. You know, every, every job we do is different from the last. There's always something new to learn. So, uh, you know, the learning just absolutely never stops uh, once you're out that door and you, you're doing this on a daily basis. Um, and the thing I hate most about this job is, is it's got to be sourcing music for corporate videos. Because if you've ever had to do it for yourself, once you've listened to like the first three, the next 30 are all absolutely the same. It's, it's a nightmare. So uh, yeah, but that's, that's where I am today. But uh, this is where I started. Uh, I'm pleased to say I've grown into my ears a bit uh, now. Um, but basically, from the age of about nine or 10, uh, my earliest inspirations were things like Wallace and Gromit. I saw Toy Story, Jurassic Park, Terminator 2, all at a very, very young age. And I was just blown away by what I was seeing. I was like, how, how are these things coming to life? Um, and uh, basically, uh, back then, there wasn't the internet and, and DVDs with special features on and all that kind of stuff that we have today. So I had to you know, just see what I could find on, like in magazines or um, on TV and things like that. Sometimes they did specials and stuff like that. Um, and Basically, from there, I just had to you know, just figure it out. And I, I read that, OK, they're doing these things on computers. Now, I had a computer at home as well, but um, it wasn't as good as what, obviously, Pixar and stuff were using. That's my first computer. It's uh, an Amiga 500. I had the upgraded version, so it had a whole megabyte of RAM and a 7 megahertz processor. So it uh, wasn't, wasn't the most powerful thing on the world. But at the age of 11, I was able to use some software called D Deluxe Paint. Um, go back a step there. Um, and that, as well as being a paint program, it actually came uh, with some software that let you animate. And uh, it's very rudimentary. It's all raster-based, so I had to scale everything. Everything's pixely and that. Uh, I had to jump through a lot of fiery hoops to actually recover this from my Amiga floppy disks and convert it onto the PC. And I'm running it in an emulator there. 
The other thing was uh, on the Amiga, the clips had to be, well, it could only be a few seconds long. So this sequence here was actually several clips stitched together. Because I could tell the emulator that it had eight megabytes of RAM, I could load the whole thing in. Unfortunately, the script for this um, is on a corrupted disk, and so I've got no way of knowing what my 11-year-old self was talking about when he did that. I couldn't record sound, and the only way I could actually produce this video in the end was to use my dad's video camera pointed at the TV press play on the animation, play on the cassette for the music, and actually say the lines as I was doing it. And if I got everything out of time, I had to stop and rewind the tape and restart. And, that. Uh, and this was an, a little intro for a game that I was making at the time, the you know, uh, robot, you know, eat your heart out, Iron Man. That's all I can say, that's how you suit up. So uh, the first video was limited to eight colors, and this one had a whopping palette of 16 colors. So. That's, that's what I was working on when I was about 11. Uh, and I, was comp I just had to figure that out for myself, because like I said, there was no, no internet back then or anything like that. Um, one day I was in a magazine, uh, sorry, a news agent, and I found a magazine, and on the front cover there was this uh, software advertised, True Space 2. This is kind of more in my teenage years. And it said full 3D animation, animation package um, you know, on, on the cover. So obviously I, I bought it. I was on holiday at the time, so the rest of the holiday, I was just like, when are we going home, when are we going home, when are we going home? I wanted to get this thing into my computer and have a go with it. And I just followed the, the instructions in the, uh, the, the manual, basically, uh, or sorry, in the magazine, and uh, it just made a, a wobbly clown, you know, just, just wobbling around like that. But from that, I was able to figure out how the primitives work and just you know, build on it and build on it. And um, again, completely self-taught. And this is just something I did you know, whilst I was at school. You know, my friends used to doodle these characters, and we had all these stupid little in-jokes. And so there's references to Sonic the Hedgehog and um, Transformers and all sorts in this. We just used to, to mess around. And lots of the signs have got really, really weird phrases and things me and my friends used to say. And you know, if you freeze frame them, there's loads of stupid stuff. It doesn't mean anybody, anything to anybody except uh, my friends and that. Um, but I, I was doing all this in my spare time, um, just basically in my bedroom, teaching myself and stuff like that. Uh, and in the meantime, at school, you know, I was saying, I want to do this, I want to do graphics, I want to do art, I want to do IT and all this kind of stuff. That's a cheap way of doing a fight scene, by the way, when you, when you can't bother to animate anymore. Um, so I was just making this up as I went along. There was a bit of a storyboard. Um, I spent about three months putting together this seven-minute cartoon, and it's... Uh, up to that point, it was like the, the best thing I'd achieved. And this, to, I, I look back at it now, and I'm, I'm quite proud of what I did. And um, I know it's, there's no anti-aliasing there, and I had to cut corners, and it took forever to render. It was rendered at sub-DVD resolution and stuff like that. Um, can't even remember why they're fighting now as such, but that's, that's what I was working on um, you know, in my spare time and stuff. So... Uh, might think I wanted to do animation as a career. Well, I did. And when it came to careers advice at school and that, I said, what do you want to do? I want to be an animator, I want to make films, or I'd like to make games. I wanted to be, you know, maybe make the next Tomb Raider or something, because the PlayStation had just come out, and that was, that was quite a popular game at the time. But I was told, no, you can't do that. You know, that's messing around, that's playing, that's, that's not a real job, you know. Uh, I was told if I wanted to work in IT and do anything like this, then I needed to get a desk job. I needed to work in an office. I needed to do spreadsheets and um, you know, write letters and things like that. that. That was where education for this kind of stuff was back in the late 90s, early 2000s, unfortunately. And uh, my experiences at college uh, were similar, unfortunately. Even though I went there to do an advanced IT class, they said, yep, yep, we're going to do graphics and we're going to do a bit of programming. Well, the graphics, um, when we finally got around to that, it was a case of open Microsoft Word, go to insert, go to clip art, and then pick your picture. There's your letterhead. That's your graphic. That, and uh, so I was obviously dis disappointed with that. And when it came to programming, well, they had us writing MS-DOS batch files to, to open several files and save a file somewhere else. And, it, you know, needless to say, I was disappointed when I was doing this kind of stuff, you know, self-taught at home. So at uh, some point in, in amongst all that, I had a go with uh, Blender as well, and I hated it because it's all back to front. The right mouse button selects things, the left mouse button moves this cursor thing around. All the sort of traditional Windows conventions, like Control-A to select all, that doesn't... That, 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 applies transformations in Blender. You have to press A on its own to select all in Blender. So everything I knew was back to front, and then I just, I just gave up on it. Uh, and, I, and I gave up on animation altogether, because I, I, I was being told by 
people I considered in a place of authority, and that was that you can't do this, you're messing around, you're playing, it's stupid, you need to grow up. And I was told that by my careers advisors, teachers, and all sorts, you need to grow up. Stop doodling in the back of your book. Um, so um, basically, I left, uh, I left it at that, and I went into healthcare for several years. And I was an administrator, and I was doing my spreadsheets, and I was doing my letters and things like that. But um, some years later, uh, one of my friends uh, is a CAD modeler, and he makes these little submarines in his spare time. I uh, used to 3D print them, and then he'd paint them up under a big magnifying glass thing, and, you know, a uh, hobbyist. And he used to post some of his designs and his little models and that on um, DeviantArt and stuff like that. Uh, that got seen by a gentleman in uh, Los Angeles, actually, uh, who was one of the writers of, I think he did about nine episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Voyager and uh, things like that. And uh, he approached Chris with um, this idea he had for this new steampunk sci-fi uh, adventure series that he was trying to pitch to Paramount or one of the other studios. Um, so he approached Chris, could you design us this steampunk sort of airship? Um, I think some of these clips have got sound, by the way. Oh, and there is flashing lights on one of these, I should warn you, as well. Um, so he just asked, is there some material that you could provide that we could put in front of the studio, just as a kind of a proof of concept and that. So I hadn't touched animation in years, so I just loaded up True Space, which is all I had and all I knew, and I just threw together some basic visuals. And at the time, this was the best work I'd ever done in that. Um, but, you know, looking back now, there are... You know, they're not great. There's a million and one things I would change. But again, I just had to work with what I had. And again, I only knew what I taught myself. And um, even then, um, oh, there you go. that's a, a giant Martian war walker tripod thing we were teasing at. Um, and then uh, we wanted a few shots of the aircraft taking off. So one thing that really transforms animation is sound. Um, some of these clips, when you see them without sound, they're, they're not that impressive, but you just add on a bit of hissing steam and some klaxons and things like that, and it can really transform things. So again, I was kind of pushing True Space as far as I could push it. I think this one uh, never finished the scene properly, um, so the particles weren't working and things like that. Um, but again, I was just um, doing what I could in the time. And there was a clip that uh, Jimmy in America had filmed of him in the cockpit of whatever this thing is. Um, so I kind of spliced it in there um, just to try and mix it and make it look like he was flying it. True Space didn't handle uh, motion blur very well, so those propellers look a bit rubbish, actually. But again, it was the best I could do with what I had at the time. Um, working with that actually led on to um, talks with um, another manufacturer that Chris worked with. And he saw this, uh, basically at a meeting um, down the pub or something at some point. And Chris was just saying, oh, look what I'm working on and stuff like that. And uh, this other gentleman, Rob, he, he said, oh, well, I work in manufacturing and we've got some prototypes and that that we could really do with a video for. And, you know, is this something you could provide? So, you know, they brought me along and I, I sat down and started looking at these things. And we, we, we put a, a couple of these you know, videos together for a few people. So I was just working in my evenings and weekends alongside working in the NHS during, during the week and that. Um, I was absolutely kind of burning myself out at the time, but I thought, well, this might lead somewhere. And it did get to a point where we were just getting in a lot more requests um, than I could kind of handle in my spare time. So it came to a point where I thought, well, really, to do this properly, I need to kind of take a leap of faith here and just make this my job now and leave, you know, the security of my other job behind. So uh, I did, and we set up a small company uh, called Malimi Digital Arts. Malimi is an acronym for my only limit is my imagination, which was basically the attitude I've always had since my childhood, you know, whether it was building with Lego or messing around with Deluxe Paint 3 or uh, later True Space and that. Um, to cut a long story short, um, basically, Malimi was working in an office alongside Think Aloud. Uh, and basically, we would just sat there, we'd bounce ideas back and forth to one another and things like that, uh, problems solved together and, and stuff like that. And we just got to a point uh, a couple of years ago, and we, we'd start discussions like, you, I'm sat here doing this, you're sat there doing that, we're, we're producing the same kind of work, so why don't we just kind of pool our resources, we'll have a bigger render farm and, and um, assets and stuff like that. So uh, in the last year, I think it's just over a year now, um, Think Aloud absorbed uh, my company, Malimi Digital Arts, and um, so we've, we've grown the team a little bit there, um, which is where we are now. Um, 
as I mentioned, I was working on True Space for a lot of that stuff, and ThinkLoud have been working on a program called Electric Image. I think it's Electric Image Animation Systems 3D is its full title, something like that. It's one that not many people have heard of. It's, um, it's really good, it's really powerful, and the renderer on it is absolutely fantastic. It's very, very fast, but it's just not very well supported. There's only a very small community of people using it these days, and um, it's still stuck in the 32-bit era, so you can't address more than three gigabytes of RAM, which is difficult when you're bringing in a fluid simulation from something like Blender or something like you want to render it, so you have to work on smaller chunks and stuff. Um, I think it was actually used for doing the background vistas and things like that in The Phantom Menace, but don't quote me on that, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, as I said, we also messed around with uh, 3ds Max and Maya for a short time, um, and they were fantastic, very, you know, very, very good at uh, what they did. But we just found, as a small company, the price of admission was just... Well, the first few jobs we did each year just basically paid for our seats and the software and the render nodes and all this kind of stuff. And it took a while to kind of re recoup those costs. And I've got a mortgage to pay and things like that. So, you know, as a, as a small company, we had to look at other options. I had been using Blender uh, quite a bit. And, um, well, basically, we, we decided we, we looked at the benefits and weighed it up by uh, comparison with other, other programs as well, like Lightwave and Cinema 4D and that. But uh, the fact that it's free and it's open source, um, I was initially a bit sort of uh, against it just because I'd had such bad experiences with it years ago. It was buggy and, like I said, the, the, the control system was back to front and everything like that. Um, but we thought, well, we'll give it another go. And during my time working as Malimi, I'd actually been using Blender to generate some of our visuals. And uh, it was sort of leaps and bounds ahead of what True Space was capable of. Um, so these are some of the, the visuals that we did for some pest control um, videos and stuff like that. Um, and when, when we merged the companies, because Nick had been using uh, Blender to do his fluid simulations and things like that, um, and I was using it sort of regularly anyway, we just decided, well, that's the one we're going to use. Um, another good thing actually about the kind of work that I do is every project I do is different and you learn so much about it. So I, I know everything about bed bugs and where they hide and where to look for them and um, all that kind of stuff. Also, uh, I've had to do a lot of, I had to do bed bug waste, I had to do mouse waste, there you go, I mean, CGI poo, um, and the CGI bird mess as well. So. Uh, I felt quite bad about this one because the mouse that I animated, I had to, um, I had to die by the end of it. it. At some point, it eats a poison pellet, and uh, it was quite a cute mouse in the end. Um, so, oh, that's another thing. Mice don't stop to do their business; they do it as they run along, um, and they do it all over your house. So, uh, that's one of the wonderful, fascinating facts that I learned. So, um, yeah, so seeing this kind of stuff, we decided Blender is the tool for us. There he is. I killed him. I killed him. So, uh, yeah, that was the most kind of humane way I could show it, I think. So, um, I don't think you've seen the last of him, don't worry. So, uh, we're looking at some of the benefits. You know, obviously, it's open source, it's free. You don't even have to install it. You can run it off a memory stick. It's lightweight. It's 100 megabytes to download the software, and that does everything. That's including the renderer and everything. Um, it supports GPU rendering, which is a big thing for us. Basically, the money that we were saving in um, not having to pay the licenses just to run the software and do our job, we could then just throw that at more GPUs and things like that for rendering. There's also online render farms. One of the big tells about how the industry is changing towards the use of Blender is the fact Pixar support it with the RenderMan render engine. Um, at present, there are only four pieces of software, sorry, four, four uh, that use um, RenderMan, and that is Maya, Houdini, Katana, and Blender. 3ds Max doesn't support it, Cinema 4D, uh, Lightwave, none of them. Um, so Pixar believes in it, which is, which, which is a good thing. Uh, AMD are now supporting it with uh, ProRender, um, and that, the ProRender also works on NVIDIA cards. It's, it's not biased, even though it is AMD technology. And uh, Blender is currently going uh, through a development cycle and having a complete overhaul, and they're introducing a new render engine called Eevee, which is more akin to like what Unreal Engine 4 can churn out. So you're looking at real-time volumetrics and real-time rendering, or as close to as possible. And it's just going to really, really change the way that uh, we're able to do our work. Uh, above and beyond is the fact it's got such an amazing community. 
Um, basically, everybody on the on the forums and everything like that, they're, they're there, they can help you. Um, and um, also, YouTube is just absolutely full of uh, Blender tutorials and that. So basically, everything I know about using it now is all from um, videos by Blender Guru and various other people and that. Uh, as I said, um, keeping the costs down by not having to pay for the um, the, the software meant that we could invest in the, the hardware instead. So that's part of our render farm, and each computer's got its own unique name. You may recognize some of those. They're all named after uh, various AI from films. Some of them are a bit more sinister than others. Uh, some of them do crash on us from time to time. And if you're wondering where they're all from, then that's the list. Um, so yeah. Um, so that's basically the, the long way around I've had to take to, to get to where I am now, because uh, fortunately in my time, education kind of let me down a bit. But uh, thankfully, you're, you're in, a, in an era where everybody's got smartphones, everybody's got technology, people get 3D animation and games development and all this kind of stuff. Um, so finally, I just want to look at one of the recent projects that we've done. This was a music video for a young lady, Jenny Willett. Basically, the way we did this was uh, we filmed her on a green screen uh, at 50 frames per second, and we sped her song up double speed. So she's having to walk, keep her balance, and sing her song twice as fast as she normally does. When we slowed it down to 25 frames per second, her singing is now in real time, but it gives her that kind of sort of airy kind of walking through Wonderland kind of effect. The hair bounces uh, differently and stuff like that. And basically. The brief we had for this project was she was going to be walking through uh, a field, sort of at dusk, um, surrounded by these sunflowers. This is just a, a previous test we did um, once we did the basic keying. These are just like billboards that we did in um, After Effects, basically, just to kind of get an idea for the, the lighting and things like that. And um, the next challenge then was to take the camera track. Uh, we solved that with a program called Synthize. Uh, we took the camera track, loaded that into Blender, and then basically put um, some scenery behind it. There you go, that's, that's that. Uh, because she was just obviously walking on the spot, we decided that the, the easiest way to, to get the movement in there was to move the world underneath her. So uh, basically, the, you can see the control points there from the tracks, but the, the cubes in the background are the actual control points that we parented all the objects to um, so that we could just move the scenery. The camera actually stays in place throughout the, the entire uh, production and that. So uh, that, that's what Nick had been working on. He, d he did the, the shoot on that one. Uh, we shot it at 4.6K on a Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro that we, we use. Uh, in the meantime, whilst that was going on, I was uh, doing some development, um, working on another project, which is technically still under wraps, but this bit's OK. Um, I was looking at a way to kind of populate an area with like a million trees and uh, so I was just uh, working with dynamic paints and things like that, and just seeing how Blender could handle this. And this used about 100 megabytes of RAM, and it probably took about two minutes a frame to render just in these tests. I mean, there's more to do. So they put the sunflowers on my desk and said, look, you've got to figure out a way of having these things blow around uh, you know, sort of convincingly in the wind. We need a million of them, or a million and one of them. Um, and they've got to gradually kind of wilt and die throughout the course of the video. It's quite a somber song, really. Um, so this is uh, just a screen capture of what I was working on. Uh, I don't know if that's playing, actually. There we go. So uh, that's the, the model that we got. Um, that's just one we downloaded. We, you know, I, didn't, I didn't have to model that in the end. And basically, I just set up a, a series of key shapes, which may also be known as blend shapes or morph targets, things like that in other software, um, just to handle like the, the rough kind of, you know, the wilting, the, the leaves kind of shriveling and stuff like that. Um, I also animated um, sort of a bit of a, a wobble on it as well. And the, the beauty of it is I only had to kind of get it to wobble one way, and then just by going into the negative values, it would you know, extrapolate the sort of the negative motion of that as well. Um, the other thing uh, was in the uh, materials for that. Uh, I set up the material nodes um, with a, a live and a dead version of the textures, which we could just um, cycle between as well. And the good thing about Blender is like pretty much every figure on there, you can, you can keyframe anything. Um, and basically, uh, when it came to the, the graph editor on that, um, I just added a noise modifier, which, as you can see there, randomly changes those figures there. So the, the actual um, waving of the leaves and that was just done sort of procedurally. There's only one keyframe of animation for that plant, essentially, and it, it does the rest itself. 
Um, so the next thing to do then was to uh, obviously do a render test of it and see how that would work. And uh, you know, this was an, an early test of it, just making sure that the textures would change in, in time with everything and that. Um, and then from that, we needed to make sure if we made them a particle, as like hair particles, would they uh, still do the same thing together? And they did. Um, that's a bit behind the scenes. We were originally using an armature to drive these things so that as it aged, it would wilt and the textures would change all at the same time, and you just had one control that would do that. Um, I duplicated the sunflower and offset some of the, the animations on the, no the noise modifier and that so that they would wave around a bit more convincingly. I think there's like two or three of them there. Uh, then the challenges for it um, came about when we, we came to render it. Um, Basically, we were trying to render as much as we could on our internal render farm, but it was a big, big, big project. So we looked at an online render farm, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. But an initial test we did just to make sure everything was working, uh, it went wrong, basically. Uh, I forgot to pack the textures for the plants, so they all came out purple. And also, we found that the drivers that I'd set up to control the way everything was moving just didn't work. Because unfortunately, the farm that we used, uh, it wouldn't allow you to run scripts for security purposes and stuff like that. So basically, I had to go back to those keyframes and um, animate them. Um, the problems that we faced on this were that uh, it was, took 15 minutes to render one frame at, at um, true 2K. Uh, the whole video, the whole song is one single take, which means there was about 7,730 uh, individual frames in there, uh, which would have taken one of our machines 80 days to render on one of our GTX 970 GPUs. Uh, we could do it on our farm in 14 days if we did absolutely nothing else. And uh, usually we've got at least two or three projects on running simultaneously. The, the render farm's always doing something. So uh, we, were, we knew we were at capacity with it. Um, and it was difficult to do test renders as well because we wanted to see what things were looking like before we committed to doing the, the whole thing. Um, so our solution was an online render farm called Sheepit. Uh, and the beauty of Sheepit is it's free. Uh, basically, the way it works is it's a distributed render farm. And um, basically, other Blender users around the world, they just uh, they've open the Sheepit application, runs on the computer, and it will just download people's projects and render in the background. And all in all, uh, it supports CPU and GPU rendering as well. And I think there were about 250 different people around the world who contributed rendering to us with several machines each and stuff like that. Uh, some frames were rendering as fast as six minutes. I think they were using um, GTX 1080 Ti's. Uh, one poor guy was rendering on his laptop. Apparently, it took two hours to render a frame for us, but uh, we're grateful, you know, and it turned out well in the end. Um, and I've just got a short clip of the, the final sort of render. Oh, sorry. Um, I want to point out that using Sheepit, we got this rendered in less than two days. Um, and it cost us nothing. Uh, we don't use it for all our projects just because um, for a lot of our projects we have to sign non-disclosure agreements obviously because we're using with, uh, working with proprietary models and things like that. And because we're putting it out there into the world, we can't necessarily guarantee that somebody couldn't kind of take our file, open it and extract things from it. In this particular project, there was no, no assets in there that were ours um, as such or that we, we didn't mind being out there in the world. So this was a perfect project to uh, give this a go on. Uh, this is the... That's the one. We, like I say, there was a million and one sunflowers in that scene. That's the one that we left. Um, in terms of what the song meant, it's like just keeping that, you know, that ray of hope there. Um, and 
that stands true to the way that I got into this industry. Is uh, you know, I was told um, you know by teachers and, and career advisors way, way, way back, at a, a sort of critical time in my life when I was a, a teenager and trying to figure out the world and what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. I was told you can't do what you want to do. You got to do something else, and uh, you know, that kind of crippled me in a, in a way. You know, and. Um, you know, it's, I was in a, a bit of a bad place for a while, actually, because I was just, I, I just thought there was something wrong with me because, uh, you know, I, I, there's these things I enjoyed and these things I wanted to do and these things I knew I could do, and I was being told that, no, these things that make you special, forget them. So, anyway, I've taken a long way around, and uh, like I say, the world's changed now, so you're in a much, much better position. Um, but that, basically, is uh, sort of uh, what, what we do and what we've been working on recently. Um, as I promised, you've not necessarily seen the last of the mouse. Um, basically, sometimes um, things go wrong. This is why we do test renders. And uh, we'd left this thing rendering sort of over the weekend. And when we came back in one day, this is the result. <laughs> Little moonwalking mouse, and then he face plants into the side of the cabinet. So we were, we were quite amused with that. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, basically what had happened there was we had the mouse running around a path with a look at target running just ahead of it, but I'd made a mistake somewhere along the line and the mouse overtook the look at target, so he's looking the wrong way. Not quite sure where he face planted, but just shows that, you know, mistakes can happen and, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of the results of it. So uh, I think finally, the, the one thing I, uh, I want to kind of leave you with is believe in yourself. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do you know, things that you know you can do. And uh, don't give up on your dreams. I know this sounds really cliche and whatnot, but it, it is absolutely true. Uh, because, you know, I, I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing with my life now. And I'm so glad that I took that risk. Because I know sort of 10 years ago, if somebody offered me the opportunity to do this, I'd probably say, no, 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 I'm in a secure job here and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't dare. So how am I going to pay my mortgage and that? But um, I got to a point where I just thought, you know, it's now or never. And, you know, I don't want to be an old man and be on my deathbed and think, oh, I wish I'd have given that a try. And I never did. So, uh, you know, like I say, just don't give up on your dreams. If this is what you want to do, then, um, you know, go for it. And that, um, it's, as um, Paul mentioned before, it's, it's a difficult one to, you know, it's a difficult um, arena to get into, really. Um, but uh, it's just finding the right opportunities. I don't really know what advice to give on that because for me, it was just a case of all the stars aligning at just the right time and seizing the opportunity and that. So uh, yeah, that in a nutshell is uh, who I am, what we're about and um, you know, what we're doing. So I'd just like to say thank you for having me again. And uh, if there's anybody who's got any questions that they'd like to ask me, then I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Are there any questions at all? Oh, this is easy. <laughs> Thanks. I've, I've got a oh, yep. What's your next? What's the next thing that you're working on? What's the next thing? Um, we're working on a couple of other projects at the moment. I've been messing around with some things um, as well. A couple of years ago, I did a 360 video. I thought, oh, this will be fun. This will be good. Uh, you know, Blender can do this as well. And it was. But it, I, I underestimated the complexity of it, um, basically. I mean, I, I love what is, what's happening in VR, and I'll <coughs> definitely be talking to some of the other speakers again uh, later on today just to find out a bit more about it. But the challenge I found with that was that uh, with normal video, you can direct your audience. This is what you want them to look at. But with 360 video, you might have something really interesting over there, but they're looking over here. So it's like, what, what do you put over here that either guides them to look over there and if you're doing that, then what's the point in doing a 360 video? Just make a two-dimensional video. Um, or, you know, what do you put all around to keep you, you know, keep your, your, uh, your audience engrossed and that? So uh, I was also wanting to have a play, because Blender does so much as well. There's a, there's a compositor built into it. There's a game engine built into it. There's a video editor built into it. They're adding 2D um, hand-drawn animation support and stuff. Um, it, it does so many things, and I'd like to sort of have a go with the, you know, physics-based uh, things in it a bit more. Um, I'm also considering working with things like Unity and Unreal Engine as well. But at the moment, I just haven't got time. I'm, I'm, I'm busy learning this on a daily basis and things like that. So, um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a lot we've got going on there. Um, 
That's a tricky one. Um, if, it, if it became free, well, absolutely, we, we would adopt it. The, the way we see it is, um, like, Blender should just be in everybody's tool belt anyway, because it's free, it doesn't cost you, there's no, there's no point of entry for that. So it's there, you might as well. The more tools you've got in your belt, the, the more you can do, you know what I mean? There's a solution for everything. Um, and I do know some people who, they, they model in Blender, but they do all their animation and their final rendering in Maya. Um, at the moment, because we're a small studio, uh, I'm aware 3ds Max and Maya are kind of the industry standard, but again, it's just, it's just costs. When you're a small team and that, we've got to keep things as low as possible, and we're satisfied with the quality of the renders that we're getting out of cycles and things like that. There are other uh, render engines you can use on Blender as well, such as Octane. Um, there's, oh, I can't think there's a couple more now, uh, POV Ray and Yaffa Ray and a few other ones in that as well. Um, but we're, we're just happy with the way Cycles worked. But like I said, if um, Maya did suddenly become free, then yeah, absolutely, we would, we would just, you know, it's free software. We're going to add it to our tool belt and, uh, you yeah, know, we, we'd find a place in the pipeline for it and that. Um, but again, once you've got the, um, you know, Maya itself, you've then got to pay for the render engine on top of that. We were using, uh, I think it was Arnold, um, and then you've got to pay for so many nodes, and if you want more nodes after that, you've got to pay more again. Whereas with Blender, you just download it as many times as you want, install it on as many machines as you've got. You know, if, you've got, if you're struggling, get a friend's laptop or something, just install it on that, and then just add it to the render queue. It's, you know, it's, it's a, lot, you know, a lot better for, it, for us, anyway. Okay. Any more? Okay. <laughs>